Welcome back to the Quantum Yoga Podcast. I'm very excited to introduce to you John Stuart Reed, who's an acoustics engineer, scientist, inventor, and the creator of the Cymoscope Pro, who's uh, based in the UK. And this, John, is our first exploration on the podcast into cymatics and the world of sound. Uh, as it relates to all, all things, really. So I'm so excited for you to be the guy to introduce it to us and to learn more about your work. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. How about, for starters, we lead with your, your background. Uh, give us, a, give us a, an autobiography of your world and sound. I know you've been involved for a number of decades. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to bore your uh, your viewers, but but the in essence, I was a, an acoustics engineer for thirty years. Uh, I ran, I founded my own business, and I ran my own pretty standard acoustics consultancy business for thirty years, like I said. And at, toward the end of that period, I just knew that um, felt it in my bones, so to speak, that it was time for a change and. As you know, as a young man, I had always wanted to be a, uh, a scientist, and um, I ended up, you know, not following that path. I ended up following the engineering path instead. But anyway, um, I really wanted to to do pure research into uh, acoustics, and so at the end of that thirty-year business uh, experience, I decided to to leave business and to go into research. And how that all happened, or, you know, the event that actually triggered that was a visit to the Great Pyramid um, in 1996 with my, my daddy because uh, we, had, we had always been good pals and uh, dad, who's no longer with us now, you know, but he, uh, he and I both studied Egyptology, amateur Egyptology. And um, and so we we were we found ourselves in Egypt in 1996, and it was the experience in the Great Pyramid at that time that really triggered the, my desire to leave uh, business and to go into research. <clears throat> and I'm on your website right now for listeners that would like to pull that up and maybe look at a few different items while we're talking here. It's cymoscope.com. And uh, there's a picture of you, looks like, inside the king's chamber here with some <laughs> kind of some kind of device. Yeah, well, what what you know, 1996, like I said, early in '96, um, my daddy and I were in the king's chamber, and what I did, uh, which I know probably thousands, maybe millions of other people have done, but I lay in this sarcophagus and performed a, a vocal glissando. Uh, which is basically a sort of smooth, unstepped enunciation of a tone uh, from, you know, from my lowest note to my highest, which is not very, it's only about uh, two and a half octaves. But anyway, I did that. And um, what I noticed at one particular frequency was that my whole body tingled. Every cell in my body seemed to, seemed to tingle. And I had never experienced anything like that, you know, in 30 years in acoustics. And so it gave me the sense in that very moment that the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, had somehow designed this effect for some particular reason. I obviously had no idea what the reason was at that time. But it, it uh, inspired me to want to study this, you know, in a professional way. And so to cut a very long story short, um, when we went back to the UK, I made inquiries and was able to get a, um, a mission organized to the Great Pyramid with a lot of equipment. And um, viewers will see that, that picture of me in the Great Pyramid the same year, 96, it was a little bit later in the year. And uh, you'll see a whole stack of acoustics equipment on the end of the sarcophagus there and uh, the idea was that I would perform a series of acoustics experiments to, in order to establish the resonant properties of the chamber, the king's chamber 
and also the sarcophagus, which I'd had that amazing experience in. So, so that's what happened. I went back in 96 and then um, just zipping forward a bit because this would take me a long time to describe the whole story, but I, I couldn't finish all the experiments in 96. So I made arrangements to go back again in 97 this time. And it was the 97 uh, experiments that really changed my life forever. And I'd like to you know, have the opportunity, if, you, if, if I may, to describe what happened that day in 1997. Please. Okay, so <laughs> what I was particularly interested in, Jonathan, was the resonances of that sarcophagus. Now, you know, I had taken conventional spectrum analyzers and all sorts of acoustics test equipment that would test um, the, the usual test that, that an acoustician would do. But I was also very interested in the concept of making the sound visible uh, in, or making the resonances visible in, in that sarcophagus. And so the way that I uh, designed, the experiment I designed, was to stretch a membrane across the open top of the sarcophagus. And then in the bottom of the sarcophagus, I had a small loudspeaker connected to an electronic oscillator. Now, the membrane had to be torsioned, you know, it had to have a nice even torsion across its surface. And the way that I achieved that was this membrane had little eyelets all the way around, 43 small eyelets. And into each eyelet, um, I, I attached a little bag of sand, all measured out perfectly to be the same weight for each bag. So we got an even torsion across the whole surface. And then I sprinkled on some sand. You know, they've got plenty of sand in Egypt. Uh, we just collected some outside the pyramid and, um, and sprinkled it on the membrane then turned on the uh, electronic oscillator and, and started to make sound basically in that sarcophagus and started to watch the little sand grains on the surface of the membrane start to, to jump. Now, you know, this is a, a new topic I know for your viewers, so, so perhaps I should explain here that the science of cymatics, which is C-Y-M-A, you know, cymatics, um, is, is all about making sound visible. And the way you do that is, with, in, in the case of a membrane and sand, you, you have a, a tensioned membrane, a spring, which you sprinkle some sand or other particulate matter on, and then you excite the membrane with sound. And what will happen is that a pattern will form on the membrane. And in all, to all intents and purposes, you can say that that pattern is an analog or a kind of model of the sound made visible. It's not quite as simple as that, but you know, that is the essence of it. And, and so what I was doing here now with the sarcophagus was sprinkling on some sand, make a sound uh, in the sarcophagus itself with a, with a loudspeaker and, a, and an electronic oscillator, and then watch what happens when that sound starts to vibrate the membrane. And what did happen was absolutely extraordinary. Um, just to step back one moment to let you know that the antiquity inspector who was there with me during the whole time, he was uh, standing up against the north wall of the king's chamber sort of filing his nails and looking extremely bored and probably thinking that this Englishman is kind of uh, a little bit doolally, you know, a bit mad. But anyway, he didn't care, I suppose, because, you know, the, the authorities have been paid a lot of money for me to do these experiments. And so he was just standing there very bored. Then what happened was I was um, stooping to, to look at this, the sand grains that started to move on the surface of the uh, membrane and suddenly an Egyptian hieroglyph, an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph appeared on the membrane or what looked like an ancient Egyptian uh, hieroglyph. And at this point, the antiquities inspector came running across to, to look at this pattern on the, on the membrane and he, and he said, 
how you do that? How you do that? And I just had to shrug my shoulders and say, I don't know, it's just happening. You know, I was interested in the resonances and here is one of the resonances. It just happens to look like uh, an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph. So then uh, I, I continued to change the frequency and every time I changed the frequency to some new frequency, a new pattern would emerge. And, uh, you know, they weren't all like hieroglyphs, but a lot of them were. You know, there were about 20 different ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, or what looked like hieroglyphs, appearing on that membrane. And obviously, I was shocked, and the antiquities inspector was shocked. And, and when he saw the first one, he, he now said, well, how, how can I help you? What can I do? And, and so he became part of the experiment, and he would be scraping the sand off, uh, the membrane of the mind structure so that we could sprinkle on fresh sand and change the frequency and then see what happened next. So, so basically we got this whole series of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs coming out on an ancient Egyptian sarcophagus. I mean, I know it sounds extraordinary, but, but in the end, you know, I was able to take photographs and we have all those photographs to show. And I have actually got a working hypothesis as to you know what the mechanism was behind that you know how it all how it all works oh my goodness wow that is that's incredible i have um and it's amazing to me that you zeroed in on the sarcophagus with all of the other elements of the pyramids around you and spaces that you could have possibly tested uh I have a good friend who's an Egyptologist, and I believe he was telling me that the sarcophagus was thought of as some kind of a, uh, like a transport device in some way. Yes, I know that there are so many different theories about, about the Great Pyramid. Um, obviously, we, are all, we all have our own filters, you know, and in my particular major filter is a is of course sound acoustics you know so naturally when i go into the great pyramid i'm using my ears more than my senses to to understand try to understand the acoustic environment and in this particular case something extraordinary really did happen and i'd like to just also mention one other before i dive you know um, just to take a step back because about three weeks before I was due to go out to Egypt, um, without my dad, by the way, he, he wasn't allowed to come, that, you know, just myself in this case. Um, but before I was due to go out, I injured my lower back quite badly. And so I was in a lot of pain and I went to a physio and, you know, had all the treatments that I could get within that period of time, within the three week period. But by the end of that, um, three week period just before I was due to go out to Egypt I was still in agony and you know I e even decided at one point that I might have to cancel the whole mission but I had paid a lot of money and it was non-refundable so I kind of I just gritted my teeth you know and took a um, took perhaps more uh, paracetamol than I should have done but anyway I managed to get myself out to Egypt and I managed somehow to get into the uh, into the king's chamber, other people carried the heavy equipment in, and so on. Um, but anyway, so during this first experiment with the with the cymatics and these amazing hieroglyphs that were or what looked like hieroglyphs coming out on the sarcophagus, something happened that was another um, astonishing moment for me, which was that I suddenly realised that all the pain in my back had left me. I, there was no pain. I'd been in agony for three weeks, and here I was, within 20 minutes of starting this experiment, all the pain had left me. And at, in that moment, I, I actually thought, ah, I know what this is. This is just endorphins masking the pain. I'm obviously very happy because of this amazing result that I was, I was seeing and hearing. And, um, and so I just thought, well, you know, when I get back outside the pyramid, the pain will come back. But in all honesty, the pain never came back. So I knew, you know, when I got back to the hotel that evening and I had a, a drink and a sit down and a kind of quiet think about the whole thing, I knew that something extraordinary had happened on two levels. One, these ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs 
you know, was obviously not a coincidence. I mean, if you get one or two that look like hieroglyphs, you could say, well, okay, that, you know, you, it could be just happenstance that you're, you know, seeing these patterns and your eye it makes them appear like hieroglyphs. But actually, when you get something like 20, that is not a coincidence, you know. So I knew there was a mechanism behind it. And then the other thing was, of course, this extraordinary healing of my lower back. So that, those two events in that one session changed my life entirely because then I decided I'm going to end my business career and go into research full time and study uh, cymatics for one. For two, what are the mechanisms to try to identify the mechanisms behind sound as a healing or as a therapeutic medium? And that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Wow. And at what point did you, did you get to create the, the cymoscope that you currently have? Is this, I, I'm, I'm would just assume that this is probably multiple iterations um, from that point to what you have now. Oh, absolutely, Jonathan. I mean, it, it was a long, a long, long journey. I mean, it has taken, it took about about 15 years, you know, from that moment in 1997. It took about 15 years before we had a, a, a prototype that was a scientific instrument, basically. We went through many iterations, and, um, and the latest cymoscope is a superb scientific instrument. Now it's highly accurate. You can put any sound into the cymoscope within within its you know published bandwidth, and that sound will be made visible. So, so just so that your viewers understand and listeners understand what I mean by that, you know we're now we're not now talking about sand on a membrane. We're talking about the medium of water. So this is what the cymoscope instrument uses. It uses water and the surface tension of water, as you know, it has a membrane. It's a, it's a very, very sensitive membrane, the surface of water. So we only use um, medical grade water in the cymoscope. This is triple distilled, very, very highly pure water. The kind of water that you can actually inject into your veins uh, or arteries, you know, without any ill effects. So it's very pure water. And what happens is, you know, when you uh, imprint a sound onto the surface of water, it's a little bit like, you know, your, your fingerprint or your thumbprint on the surface of glass where you leave a pattern behind. Well, it's a little bit like that with sound. Sound imprints a pattern on every membrane around you, including, in this case, you know, in the cymoscope instrument. Um, but, you know, it also imprints patterns on everything in your environment, for example, on your own body. So all of your skin, uh, when you're in a, an environment where there's sound, your skin is acting like a membrane. Every membrane around every, every cell of your body is receiving a cymatic pattern. Um, so, you know, pat cymatic patterns happen at all scales in the, in the universe. It's an amazing uh, fact that that the scale is irrelevant. So we can talk about cymatic patterns on the surface of living cells in your body. We can talk about cymatic patterns, like for example, the one that's on the planet Saturn, on the North Pole of the planet Saturn. Uh, any of your viewers want to look this up online, you'll find that there's a giant hexagon on the North Pole of that planet. And it is so large that it could, it, it could swallow three Earths, <laughs> so three Earths inside that hexagon. So give you some idea of the kind of scale. And then there, there are beyond that scale, if you're talking now about the scale of, for example, galaxies, um, there's a mainstream model of uh, cosmology that suggests that the most powerful force after the Big Bang was sound. So sound in this particular cosmological model, sound organized the matter of the early universe. It was more potent than gravitational force, more potent than any other force. 
And, and according to that model, that is why if you look up at the sky through a powerful telescope, you will see groups of galaxies in one particular area of the sky, groups of galaxies in another area of the sky, um, and with huge spaces in between. And the reason is, according to that model, is sound. But anyway, so but coming back, you know, to the cymoscope instrument, which is where your question uh, started. So we imprint sound onto a water membrane, but the way the instrument does it, it's a very controlled process. So everything is controlled. You know, the, the, the shape of the sound goes through signal processing equipment before it reaches the cymoscope. It then goes into what's called a voice coil motor which is the device that imprints the sound onto the water. And then we have obviously a, uh, an illumination for the water and a, a very high spec digital camera that picks up the pattern on the surface of the water. But I should also mention, Jonathan, that the pattern that we see when we make a sound visible is not only on the surface of the water. And this is where the science of cymatics gets really interesting because the pattern actually goes right through the water, right into the depths of the water. And the reason it does this is because sound organizes matter. Wherever you've got sound and you've got matter, you've got the organizational power or ability of sound to organize that matter. And, and in this case, with the cymoscope instrument, the, the water molecules are organized right throughout the depths of the, uh, of the cuvette, which is the imaging medium within the cymoscope. And the reason that is so important when it comes to uh, sound therapy that I mentioned you know, earlier in relation to my healing in the Great Pyramid uh, is because if you now think of your body as being a, a, a fluid medium, I mean, it's, it's very high percentage of water, so whenever you're in a sonic environment, wherever it's just music that you're playing in your home or you're out in nature and you're being surrounded by the sounds of nature, those sounds are actually impinging on your, on your physiology. They're literally going into your body, through your body in many cases, the low frequencies. But as they go into your body, they leave a pattern of energy in the fluids of your body. So not just on the surface membranes of your cells, but right into the, uh, into the visceral waters uh, of your body, and even in, into your brain, into the cavities in your brain. So just think of that, music or whatever, these patterns are manifesting inside your body and on the surface of your skin the whole time. Wow. <laughs> so, I think so, I'm left. Just said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, my gosh, it just brought so many questions to mind. And along the way, it, it, uh, I'm sure you must be familiar with Mar Masuru Emoto's uh, crystallization pictures of water. Of course. Yeah, and is there any? Do you see a relationship between uh, human intention? and and the shapes that water can make and sound and is there some kind of a relationship there well there the, the definitely is i mean i see this on a fairly regular basis in our lab here because um you, you know in quantum mechanics the observer very often uh, influences the outcome of the experiment and this happens like I say, regularly in the cymoscope laboratory, where I'm 95% certain, let's say, I don't have the whole uh, proof yet, but I'm pretty certain that I, I myself am influencing the outcome of experiments in some cases. And then another really interesting phenomenon is that the sound files that I often receive, you know, because Part of the way that, that we earn our living here in this laboratory is by imaging other sound files for other people. And so people send us sound files, we image them, and there's a, you know, an imaging fee. Now, 
in many cases, we see sound files made visible that contain information about the person or, or whatever the sound was that was sent to us. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. Um, one of the services that we offer, we call it Voice Mandala, and people can send us their voice file and we make it visible and then they print it out at home, put it on their wall, give it to a loved one, whatever, you know, that type of thing. And, um, but we have some agent, agents in different parts of the world who send us voice files from their own uh, customers. And so you might have, say, a sound therapist working in you know, some particular country, and he or she has a following of people that work you know, with them, and then they will send us their sound files. Well, I'm going to give you this example of a sound file that we received from an agent in uh, Mexico, and I, it was a man, and I put this sound file into the cymoscope, and what I saw, normally you get a kind of fairly symmetrical pattern, usually a little bit like kaleidoscope pattern. Uh, every person has a different uh, vibrational imprint on the water, so everyone is literally unique, just as you can tell on the phone when you speak to somebody uh, that you know. Even if they don't introduce themselves to you, you can tell immediately who that person is, can't you? Because your ear-brain mechanism is so sensitive and um, you know, the, the way that your brain figures out all those frequencies uh, is so clever, but the cymoscope does exactly the same thing in a different way, but the cymoscope shows us the pattern of a voice, a given voice, very accurately. And so in this particular case, I saw this pattern, but it had a very strange kind of um, protrusion at the bottom of the pattern. And I, whatever I did to try to you know, tweak the controls a little bit. I couldn't get rid of this little protrusion. And so I just had to say, well, that must be, you know, that's the, the voice of this guy and that's all I can do about it. So I sent it back to our agent in Mexico with an apology saying, I'm really sorry that this pattern has this strange protrusion at the bottom. I said, it looks a bit like a tooth. And, and the, guy said, the guy wrote back to me, he said, oh, don't worry about it, John. The guy's a dentist. No, <laughs> I mean, this is really extraordinary, but this is true. And I could give you many other examples where the pattern that we see contains some aspect of the person. So it's a kind of a holographic storage medium. All we're receiving is a, is a wave file, but this wave file is not just sound. It's actually containing some holographic data relating to the person and so that's you know an absolutely extraordinary um concept to me I, I still don't understand it fully but at least you know we have the basis of some kind of uh, concept in terms of holography to to link it to wow uh, lead us into your explorations into healing and what you have been up to in this area in, sorry, say that again, Jonathan. <clears throat> yeah, your explorations into healing, um, healing the human body. and yes. yeah. I'd be very happy to, you know, to share information uh, relating to this. So, you know, going back to that time in the Great Pyramid, I went in there, like I said, you know, in agony, and yet within 20 minutes something miraculous or it seemed to be a miracle really where the pain completely left me and and but also left me in this inspired <laughs> place in my mind and heart where you know i really wanted to understand what had happened to me well now i have um after all these years um i have some insights that i'm very happy to share with your viewers and listeners now in relation to uh, to how sound can act as a therapy. It's actually a very powerful therapeutic modality. And a lot of people around the world are now, are now you know, latching onto this. They're using sound not only in, um, in the kind of esoteric circles, but, but also even in the mainstream, you know, hospitals, clinics are now beginning to use 
sound and ultrasound in many different ways. But let me describe, anyway, a kind of model that I think your viewers and listeners will be able to, um, to conceive. So what happens is when your body undergoes some form of illness, it doesn't matter what it is, it could be um, some physical trauma or it could be an invasion of some pathogen or it might be um, a high level of toxicity. You know, so you've, you've uh, imbibed something that is toxic to your, to your body's chemistry. Whatever it is, what happens in your body is that this um, event causes a certain system of your body to shut down. It doesn't mean it's going to kill you, um, but you know what an illness is, is a particular system or might be systems of your body that are shut down. They're not actually functioning in the normal way that they should. It, it means that the cells of that system in your body are in a sleep state. It's a kind of uh, a kind of comatose state where they're not dying, um, but they're not replicating either. So that's why it throws the body out of balance. So when we talk about illness, what we're really saying is that some system or systems of the body have shut down and they're in this kind of quiescent state. Now, you know, if you look this up in medical literature, what you'll find is that this, um, this quiescent state of cells uh, is called the G0 phase. And what this means is exactly what I've said, that the, the cells are effectively asleep and not replicating. And in order to move them from G0 into what biologists would call the G1 phase, which is the phase of cells where they're um, preparing for replication, to make that transition from G, G0 to G1, some event has to occur. Now, if you look it up in mainstream literature, what you'll find is that the event is either nutrition, so an injection of nutrition can cause this triggering, or uh, simply rest, sleep. In other words, you're leaving these cells quiescent for as long as it takes for them to do their own healing process. But in my hypothesis, there is this third method, which is sound. And sound acts as a kind of nourishment, a kind of food. It's an energy, of course, and it's an energetic form of nourishment for the cells to move the cells from G0 to G1. And the other aspect to this, which is, I think, quite easy to, um, to visualize, and I can send some graphics that will support this, is that when sound impinges on your body and, and enters your, your body, as I said earlier, a pattern, a cymatic pattern forms on the surface membrane of every cell, or almost every cell in your body, because some, there are some cells that don't, like brain cells, don't have the same kind of membranes that your bodily cells have. But almost every cell in your body receives a cymatic pattern. Now, what you need to know at this point is that every, the way that cells communicate with their brothers and sisters around them is via um, what are called integral membrane proteins. These are hundreds, sometimes thousands of little projections from the cellular membrane. And they're little like, they're li you could think of them as antennae. They're kind of projecting out like little antennae into their environment. And this is the method, this is the, the way by which cells receive information, send information, and also the way that they absorb nutrients and excrete waste products, all through these little IMPs, integral membrane proteins. Well, now if you can visualize a cymatic pattern manifesting on the surface membrane of, these, of every cell in your body, or almost every cell in your body, and visualize what happens when that sound is, is at a particular level, it can um, effectively massage tweak these little antennae, these little IMPs. And what I'm believing is happening in hypoth hypothetically is that that is the way that the cell is woken, reawoken from its sleep state is simply by this pattern of energy literally massaging the IMPs around the cell. 
and bringing the cell back online, bringing it into the G1 phase so that within a matter of hours, the cell is now um, moving again into replication phase. So there's a lot more to it than that. You know, there's, it's a, a very complex subject. And, but I hope that that little snapshot that I've given you, um, you know, gives all your viewers and listeners some insights into the mechanisms by which sound can have apparently such miraculous effects on the, on the physiology of the body. And it sounds like that is what must have happened to your lower back in this, uh, in that, in that experience of the sarcophagus. Um, certainly, that that mechanism would have been involved, but there are other mechanisms involving uh, pain management with sound, which are which take me a little bit more time, a little bit more complex to explain. But basically, pain itself can also be mediated. So there were two things happening uh, that day. One is that pain was mediated because the pain all left me within 20 minutes. But then the other aspect to it is that the pain never ever came back. So uh, the way that I'm looking at this, there were two mechanisms at work simultaneously. One mediated the pain for me within 20 minutes, but the other mechanism carried on working for many hours afterwards. And this was the mechanism by which the, um, the muscles in my lower back were strengthened and healed within a matter of hours, basically. So it's an extraordinary, uh, it's, it is like a miracle in a way, the way that sound can act as a therapy. And it is, it's wonderful that, that hospitals and clinics are now starting to use sound as a therapy. There's a, there's a company in the USA called Cyma Technologies, you know, C-Y-M-A, then Technologies uh, Incorporated, and um, run by a, a wonderful woman called Mandara Cromwell. And she is, uh, she is a manufacturer of these sound therapy devices that are now finding themselves into all sorts of different clinics and uh, uh, outlets around the, U, the USA and, and further afield where sound is being used as a, as a therapeutic medium. And I think it's a great thing because, you know, there's no, to no toxicity at all. It's entirely non-invasive. Um, there are no side effects, not, you know, not like pharmaceuticals where there can be, um, you know, difficult side effects. Sound doesn't, doesn't have any sound effects. Um, and you know, if we go back to the days of Pythagoras, um, one of the things that Pythagoras said uh, um, was that, that music could be used instead of medicine. Um, you probably know that, that none of Pythagoras's works actually you know, are extant. All, all that we know about Pythagoras comes through his, his biographers. And one of his biographers was a guy called Iam, Iamblichus. And it was Iamblichus who, who wrote that quote of Pythagoras's. And that was one of the things that Pythagoras said, that music could be used instead of medicine. Well, how did he know that? <laughs> well, obviously, he was getting great results with, with music. And of course, today, music therapy is a mainstream clinical discipline. Um, the, the one thing that I would say about music therapy, though, is that although it's having, they're having great results, Music therapists don't really look at the biological effects that you know that the music is having on the body. Strangely enough, that you know it's more of a, uh, a psychological effect that they're looking at, where in fact music is affecting us on both levels, both you know both emotionally and at the biological level. So um, anyway, Pythagoras was you know right on. He was spot on. That's. And he's, you know, going, we're talking now 2,500 years ago that, uh, that Pythagoras was saying this. And here we are, you know, in the 21st century, and we're just kind of catching up with, uh, with Pythagoras in his, uh, in his thinking. And um, what a wonderful thing, though, that we're going to be seeing a future where sound is a powerful modality. Can you use cymatics and sound as a diagnostic tool in addition to a therapeutic one? 
Well, we are just beginning. It's a great question, Jonathan. And we are just beginning to, um, to find ways to analyze the, the sounds from, uh, that we see in the cymoscope. So I'll give you an example here that if you, if you have a, a heart uh, condition, some kind of a heart murmur or you know, some, some cardiac problem, if you, if you record the sound of the heart and put that into the cymoscope instrument, you make your heart sound visible. And when you do that, then you can then analyze the, the patterns that form by a new technique that uh, has been co-developed between myself and uh, Professor G, who is at Rutgers University in the USA. And this new tool that we have developed in distribution equation, I know it sounds rather fancy, but basically what it does is it analyzes uh, these sound patterns that we call cymaglyphs. And so if you had a heart condition, you could um, put that uh, sound into the cymoscope and actually be able to um, see the result of that sound in the in the water and analyze it and you know from that um, we I mean we've had a senior cardiologist say that this could become a powerful technique for analyzing heart sounds in the future and another thing that um, another way that you can work with <clears throat> uh, with the cymoscope is by the sounds of your cells you know every every cell I, I spoke earlier there about the membranes and the IMPs but every cell also sings it literally makes a sound and this is the work of uh, Professor James Jim Zesky from UCLA where he uses an atomic force microscope to listen in to the sounds of cells and so now we, we have the sounds of cells that we can actually put into the cymoscope and um, and make them visible well, one of the ways that we've been working recently with the sounds of cells is to differentiate uh, cancer cell sounds from healthy cell sounds. And um, the reason for this work is because when surgeons are, um, they have you opened and they're, they're cutting tissue to remove a tumor, say, apparently it's very difficult for the surgeon to sometimes know where the tumor ends and where the healthy cell tissue begins. And, um, you know, I'm not experienced in this area at all, but, but apparently it is difficult for surgeons to, to sometimes differentiate healthy from cancerous tissue. And so by having a device where you could, in real time, distinguish between the healthy cells and the cancer cells, it would help the surgeon to know where, literally where to cut and so this work that we've been doing, this is again in collaboration with Professor G at Rutgers, is making the sounds visible from healthy cells and cancer cells uh, in real time. And uh, so that's another you know, powerful technique that the cymoscope can be used for. Wow. When you're, give us a, an idea of where where, what frequency, at what amplitude we're talking about here that these cells are making sounds? Okay, well, um, obviously you can't hear them. <laughs> if, you could hear, if you could hear the sounds of your cells, it would probably drive you nuts, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> no, the levels are extremely low, very, very low uh, sound levels. So, you know, way, way down below even the quietest anechoic chamber that you can think of, you know, which goes down to kind of uh, 35 dBA, you know, so it's even lower than that. I don't actually know the, the figure off the top of my head, but it's, it's a very, very low uh, level of energy. But in terms of the frequencies, I do know those because the frequencies um, that come from the, the Jim Zesky, uh, what he calls sonocytology work, and also now um, the sounds of cancer cells that we've been uh, that we've been sent by other universities that are working in this similar area. Um, the sounds are all in the audible band. That's the first thing to say. So we can actually hear them, mm. uh, you know, without doing any to the frequencies. 
and most of the frequencies are centered around 1000 hertz. So typically in the range kind of 900 hertz up to about 1.1 kilohertz, something like that, you know, so 900 to 1100 hertz. So we can hear them, they're quite high frequencies, but they're not so high that, you know, that they're outside the range of human hearing. Human hearing can go way up to, what, 17,000. So, you know, so 900 to 1100 is, is just a, a pretty high frequency, but not very high. So we can hear them quite easily. And of course, the cymoscope instrument can image them very easily. So, um, the, the, you know, the, the challenge is how do you pick up these, these very, uh, very low level sounds. One method, as I mentioned, is the method by Jim Zesky, which is using atomic force microscopy. Um, this is where they use a tiny, well, it's a microscopic uh, cantilever that literally rests on the cell. And as the cell literally breathes, so the cantilever is moving up and down. And at the other end of a cantilever, is a, a piezoelectric crystal which converts the mechanical motion of the cell membrane in its respiration uh, into an electrical signal. So that's one method. Mm. Um, but there's another method ca called um, Raman spectroscopy where they use a laser. So laser light is, uh, is scattered across the surface of tissue and the, the backscatter that comes back to the, um, to the diode that picks up this, uh, this scattered light, that then is providing a kind of modulation to the, to the light. And then you can demodulate the light and turn it, you can sonify it back into a sound so that you can actually hear the sound of the cells. And that's what we are, that method is how we are able to make the sounds of the cancer cells and the healthy cells uh, visible. I mean, it is a little bit, you know, uh, it sounds, I know it sounds a bit complicated, um, and it isn't that easy to be honest, but, but, but certainly the principles are pretty straightforward, you know, in the realm of science. And, and now that we've got the cymoscope, it opens a completely new window, you know, on our world and universe, because, you know, it's a little bit like if you think of the world before the existence of the microscope, Jonathan, you know, what did we know about the microscopic world before the microscope? Well, actually nothing, you know, because everyone, no one knew that such a world existed. And when, um, when Robert Hooke, you know, the famous English scientist, Robert Hooke, uh, when he first, he didn't invent the microscope, but when he started using it, he was one of the first scientists to begin using it. And he published a wonderful book called Micrographia with these, it was before the days of photography, so he had to literally draw all of the things that he was seeing. And when he published that book, uh, the scientists of the day ridiculed it and said, this cannot be, this is, uh, you know, not, this is not new science, this is um, poppycock, basically. And uh, they didn't believe it, in other words. And it was only when they looked down the microscope with their own eyes that they then became believers. So. And then if you think about um, the, the world of the, the, of the cosmos, the universe, what did we know about, about the cosmos before the, the invention of the telescope? Well, very little, really. I mean, I know that you know, some very clever observers had observed what they thought were um, stars that were moving about, turned out ultimately to be planets, of course. But we really didn't know much at all about the universe before the age of the telescope. And it's the same kind of principle with the cymoscope. What did we know about sound before the age of the cymoscope? Well, actually, you know, what most, I think most of your viewers and listeners will be thinking right now is that sound is a wave. Uh, because we, this is what we're taught at school, we're taught it at university, we're taught it in colleges and so on, sound is a wave. Uh, and so um, what that conjures up in the mind's eye is literally a wave wiggling through the air from your mouth as you speak. Um, you know, and this is a completely false model. This is not uh, how sound propagates. Sound propagates spherically, all audible sounds anyway, propagate spherically 
And what the cymoscope does is to show us a cross section through the sound bubble. That's literally what it's mm -hmm. doing. Um, and so now when you see, you know, you see a, a cymoglyph, a, a sound pattern from the cymoscope, you, you can then visualize this bubble of energy that, you know, what started as a bubble is now being effectively sectioned. So we're seeing a section, a cross section through that sound bubble. And um, so it's a, it's a fascinating new world that's opened up for us with the cymoscope instrument. Yeah. And that point that you're making, it really just in my mind's eye kind of clarified how, how to see sound a little bit more clearly. It's, and because these sounds are oscillatory in nature, a single snapshot's really not showing you the whole picture. There's, the wave is moving up and down. So in that sort of uh, oscillation of the spherical oscillation, there's, there's uh, a much more dynamic geometry that's happening. Yes, I, I think, you know, what, what, what maybe I should add here that makes it a little bit uh, clearer is that, um, you know, first of all, why, why do scientists, why do engineers even, you know, talk about sound waves? Um, well, in one sense, it's because historically they were always called that. So that, you know, we're kind of stuck with the, the name that, that was originally coined for, to, to describe that, this part of, this aspect of nature. Um, so we're stuck with the name really. But the other aspect to it is that when you, if you do, if you create a graph of the sound energy using a device, for example, like an oscilloscope, you see sound on an oscilloscope, it will look like a wave. So, you know, from that perspective, you can, it's quite easy to understand why it's being called a wave because it's a, graphically it's shaped like a wave but th that is a graph that is not its actual form in space in mm. space it is a sphere it's a bubble let's say it's a bubble um what so where's the wave come into the bubble well this sphere is oscillating or you know pulsating let's say in and out in a rhythmic fashion so the the sphere while it expands at the speed of sound, of course. Mm. It, at the same time, if you think of the, think of the surface of this bubble as it's expanding, it's, it's not only expanding, it's also pulsating in and out. And it's that pulsation, which when you graph that energy, looks like a wave, but nevertheless, it's still a bubble. Um, so I think it's very important to you know, understand that distinction. The other thing that is interesting that comes out of all of this, and I think you're, your viewers and listeners will, will find this interesting, is that as this bubble, as you increase in frequency, let's say you go up to uh, the, the highest frequency that any human has ever heard. You've got a very young child, and some children can hear up to 20,000 hertz, right? Um, what happens is when you get up to 20,000 and start to go above that, let's say you go up to 60,000 where many birds are singing at up to 60,000. Although you can hear them, you know, you're hearing the part of their spectrum which is in the lower part of their spectrum. But a lot of birds are singing way up to 60,000. Well, when you reach those kind of frequencies, up to 20 and then up to 60,000, this bubble that I'm talking about starts to flatten. So now it's no longer a true bubble you could say it's more like, well, eventually it becomes like a kind of cigar shape. You know, it's, it's flattening and flattening as you go up higher and higher in frequency. So the bubble flattens and flattens and flattens. And it ends up, by the time you get up to the frequencies that dolphins create um, in water, we're talking now up to anything up to 250,000 uh, hertz. So this is really, you know, high, very high frequency. And now sound is no longer a bubble. Now sound looks like a searchlight beam, um, like you would get, you know, from a lighthouse or something. It's a beam of sound now. And and what happens with with dolphins is really interesting because um, when the dolphin sends out its uh, this high frequency beam, it's called an echolocation beam. Um, that beam of energy is a, is a pulse. The dolphin doesn't send it out in a constant 
uh, way, it sends it out in a series of pulses called a train of pulses. And every pulse of high frequency energy that the dolphin sends out strikes an object in the water, whatever the dolphin wants to see with its sound sense, it strikes an object. And then that object reflects, a bit like radar, you know how radar works, where a beam is sent out and that reflects off an object. Same sort of thing happens for the dolphin. Now it's been, um, marine biologists have known for a long time that dolphins can see with sound, or at least it's been assumed that they can see with sound, or else why would nature have developed or evolved this uh, echolocation sense, you know, the sending out of these high frequency pulses. So it's been assumed that dolphins can see with sound for a long time. But what happened a few years ago was um, we were approached by a, a guy called Jack Kasowitz, who is based in Florida, and he works with dolphins every day of his life. Um, and Jack was interested to know whether the cymoscope could make dolphin sounds visible. And um, certainly the sound files that, you know, that he let me hear, uh, I knew that they would be imageable. I didn't know what we would see in the sound files. But anyway, um, I'm going to cut a, a long story short here by, by saying that, we, that he sent us a series of sound files related to objects that he had placed in the water for a dolphin to echolocate upon. So like, for example, one was a flower pot. He put the flower pot in the water, held it under the water, and the dolphin echolocated on the flower pot. He then had a, um, a hydrophone, that's like an underwater microphone, that picked up the reflected sound from the flower pot. Uh, that, you know, the dolphin sends out its beam, that reflects off the flower pot. Some of that scatter goes back to the dolphin, but some of it is picked up by the hydrophone. And then through you know, some really high-end audio equipment, he was able to record that sound reflected from the flower pot. He then sent us the sound file, which was a standard wave file. We put it in the cymoscope, and guess what, Jonathan? We saw the flower pot, right, in the water. <laughs> I mean, it, it was an absolutely extraordinary moment. Um, and then we proceeded to make visible a whole series of other objects that the, that the dolphin had echolocated on. There was a plastic duck, there was a plastic cross, there was a ball, there was a cube, and so on. All of these objects we made visible in the cymoscope. Wow. And I think you've got a link from your website over to speak. Well, anyways, there's one here that kind of came up. I don't know if I'd click twice to get here. It was speakdolphin.com. And there is an image of a man that's been uh, replicated from that hydrophone. It's crazy. What happened there, Jonathan, was that um, after we did that series of experiments with you know these simple plastic objects, a few years went by. I think it was 2012 when we did the original experiments, and then I'm pretty sure it was 2016 when Jack called me and he said, uh, "John, w would you be able to make visible a person's face if the, if we got someone in the water?" And we echo got the you know task the dolphin to uh, echolocate on someone's face, and I said, well, I don't know. I mean, it's worth a try, Jack. I had no idea whether it would actually work, um, particularly because the face is you know very soft material, whereas you know these plastic objects clearly were you know very hard materials relatively. But anyway, I said, well, let's give it a try. So anyway, this day uh, Jack um, did put someone in the water, a man, and um, this guy called Jim Donahue, and uh, tasked the dolphin, he thought anyway, tasked the dolphin to, uh, to echolocate on Jim's face. Well, he sent the sound file, and we put it in the cymoscope, and this particular day, I was in the lab by myself, um, and my wife was, you know, we, where the lab is, it's connected to our home, and, and she was up in the office, and uh, I put this sound file through, and, and I saw what looked like a man, a full man, you know, not just a face. 
And I, I called for Annalise to come down. I said, Annalise, come down and look at what do you see here? And she says, it's, a, it's an image of a man. And, you know, I'd, I'd looped the sound. So it, it, was, it wasn't just a single pulse from the dolphin. It was literally, you know, looping. And so the man kept appearing and disappearing, appearing and disappearing. <clears throat> Obviously, we, you know, at some point we, we took a screen grab and were able to see the actual image of the, of the whole man. And, um, and what's more, in the video that we, that we shot that day, there are two frames. One of the frames, the man's hand, Jim Donahue's hand, as we now know, uh, is in one position. And then in the second frame, his hand is in a slight, slightly different position because obviously he's under the water and he's moving about a bit. Mm. And so the dolphin had taken two shots in that moment, split second, two pulses of the full you know, image of Jim. And we saw them in the cymoscope. Now, um, we subsequently published that data online. It went viral, actually. It went all over the world. It was a really big story about it in the science press and so on. And with, like a lot of these things, you know, where something extraordinary happens, uh, we got a lot of um, discredit. A lot of people said, this is impossible, right? But here were the results. And this, this result was not isolated. You know, we had already done the series of experiments in 2012, right? So, um, but the truth, of it, the truth is, we still do not understand the mechanism. How is this possible? How can we, from a simple mono sound file, actually be able to recreate an image that was picked up by a hydrophone? And we still don't understand. I ha actually have got a working hypothesis, but whether it's correct, who knows? You know, it's, it's just time will tell. But it's an extraordinary thing. And, and, and one of the areas that came out of this, uh, one conclusion you could say, is that we now think that dolphins not only see with sound, but also that they can share pictures with each other. So if, if, the, if, if a pilot dolphin who is... Um, you know, circling the pod of dolphins to check for predator, predators coming into the area, like say a shark or some other predator coming in, uh, this pilot dolphin can take a photo of that, of that shark and beam it to all the other dolphins who will instantly see it in their mind's eye. And this is the, you know, the concept that we have of course, it's a hypo hypothetical concept right now. But what, what we're planning to do is to, or Jack is planning to do, is to interrupt uh, a beam between two dolphins and pick it up with a hydrophone and then put that into the cymoscope and see whether we can actually see the conversation literally as a picture going on between one, one dolphin and another dolphin. And if it works, you know, what it would mean is that dolphins their language is a language of pictures it's a pictorial language and that's the hypothesis that we're currently working with wow <laughs> uh, i hope i have time for one more question john do you do you have time for that or do you need to go sure yeah please carry on um i'm wondering if you have done any investigations explorations into mantra and or any uh, uh sort of sacred sounds that have been used in different spiritual traditions? Yes, I have. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, about our voice mandala service where people, I should mention, by the way, I should give it a bit of a plug here, Jonathan, if you don't yes, mind, because please. it's the way that we, it's the way that we fund our research here. You know, we are self-funded. There's nobody feeding money to us, you know, so... So the way it works is that we offer services for imaging any sound. You, you can send us the sound of your loved one. You can send us the sound of your dog, your cat, whatever. You know, we can, uh, we can make it uh, visible very accurately. Um, but some people want, they don't just want a still image. Some people want the video. They want to see it dynamically moving in the water. And we're happy to do that as well. That's a bit more expensive, but we're happy to do that. But just before I, I mention the video section, I should also say 
that when we, when we image a voice mandala now, we are sending $12 uh, for everyone that we image. We're sending $12 to a wonderful organization in, in, in the USA called uh, Yoga Gives Back. And this is a, you can look this up online, Yoga Gives Back are now helping Indian, underprivileged Indian women to start little businesses, you know, to, to help them uh, get off the ground, basically. And, and so we're doing our bit, uh, you know, to help by, like I say, sending them $12 for every voice mandala that we do. But anyway, going on to, on to the video aspect, the reason I'm mentioning video imaging is although it's a more complex and a, a more expensive process, some people want to understand the dynamics. You're talking now about sacred uh, sounds and sacred geometry. And the only way to really study that properly is with the video. And so we have actually imaged a lot of mantras uh, for very often for people in India but also people from the USA and, and other parts of the world. And one of the things that, that came out of it, or has come out of it, is that uh, sacred uh, sounds do create sacred geometry. Um, you know, you get absolutely beautiful geometry that comes out of man most mantras create really gorgeous geometry. Uh, one strange uh, aspect that we have not been able to uh, to understand so far is that particularly with men who are involved in sacred chant um, and I'm going to now mention Jonathan Goldman because you know Jonathan Goldman is one of the world's uh, famous uh, sound healers He's, and is and a good friend of ours you know for many many years well Jonathan's voice, um, because he's you know doing spiritual practices every day of his life. When we when we image Jonathan's voice, it almost invariably creates seven sided geometry, which is very unusual in nature. You know, if you're thinking of now in terms of the morphology of flowers or you know plants, whatever, seven sided is very very rare. But um, with spiritual practices, seven sides comes up a lot, particularly with male voices, but we have seen it with female voices as well. And we don't understand the reason for that, but obviously there will be a reason. And um, someone needs to do a study of, uh, of, of human speech with the cymoscope. Because one of the things um, that you can do with the cymoscope is to study language. And um, we have actually got a, a university that have acquired cymoscopes to do just that, where you can put in, you can inject uh, one particular language into the cymoscope and see a train of patterns related to that speech. But then if you say the same words, but in a different language, you get a whole new set of patterns. And, um, and the geometry, of course, in one language to another, is completely different and that would be an area of study for someone just as the sacred sounds would be an area of study but you know we're just a small lab here the whole idea is to be able to um, have cymoscopes in labs all over the world and it has started to happen you know we do have a number of universities now using cymoscopes so i think in future years jonathan you will see Someone, it hasn't happened yet, but someone will acquire a cymoscope specifically to study sacred language, uh, sacred sounds rather. Uh, and then I'm sure you'll see some wonderful uh, research coming out of that. Is there uh, another slightly uh, off topic? Hopefully it can be a short answer. Uh, I've asked this before, previous guests, there's been discussion around the A tuning of 440 and 432. Um, of any significance of 432 as being more beneficial to cells and and bio, you know human biology. Um, do you have any opinion on this? Well, um, <laughs> it's a big, it's a very big subject. Is it okay? <laughs> um, I, I think 
Well, I, I'll give you a very, I'll give you a very quick answer, you know, because I am interested in that subject, Jonathan, and uh, I have written, um, already written part one of a two part article uh, on the, the whole subject of concert pitch. So uh, 432 Hertz is being hailed by many musicians around the world as being the natural tuning uh, pitch, you know, for musical instruments, as opposed to the the traditional 440 hertz, which is um, some some orchestras are using 441, some are using 442, but most orchestras around the world have plumped for 440 hertz. So um, one of the arguments in uh, in favor of, uh, or one of the arguments I should say against 432 hertz by the detractor, you know, detractors would say that Hertz is just another way of saying, uh, it's just another name for cycles per second, which of course frequency, you know, was originally termed CPS or cycles per second until um, Hertz was, was used as a scientific um, suffix, you know, for all frequencies. Um, but anyway, so cycles per second, now, then, when you think about the second as a as a uh, time period, that is a, a man-made construct. You know, a second is not a universal um, section of time at all. You know, it is entirely uh, uh, you made by humans, right? Uh, you know, a second. So, if you change a second, if you change the value of a second to say okay, one second is now going to be equal to 1.2 seconds of the old seconds, like, you know, how you change currency sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what would happen to that number, that 432 number? Well, the 432 number would be a completely different number if the second was different. So you see the whole question comes down to um, the, the, is the second an arbitrary number? Well, yes, it is an arbitrary number. However, and this is where it starts to get really interesting, Jonathan, that although the number 432 is an arbitrary number, the frequency itself, you know, it doesn't matter what the time signature of this frequency is. When you put that frequency into a cymoscope, the cymoscope knows nothing about time. It doesn't know about the time of one second being arbitrary. It just makes that sound visible, right? And so the, the, the uh, concept that I'm working with here now is to do a study, which would be part two of my article on concert pitch. So part one is already available now. It's on our website. You can, you can go and buy it. You know, it's like, a, it's basically the history of concert pitch. But part two is going to be all the scientific aspect of concert pitch. And so what I need to do, to, I have already begun that, that two, second part but to to complete it i need to do a study with the cymoscope where i'm looking at the effects of 432 hertz on physical matter in this case water versus the effects of uh, 440 hertz on physical matter i.e water and and when i've got the results of that study then i think we'll see um some interesting conclusions coming forward but without that study, I don't think it's possible to say that 432 hertz is the natural tuning frequency. Maybe it is, but we need to do the research, Jonathan, to, uh, to be able to uh, get some kind of surety around that. Wow, John, what a fascinating and mind-blowing conversation. Uh, thank you for your time. It's been a great pleasure, Jonathan. And I, I know your, your voice is breaking up a little bit at this end. I hope that my voice has been coming through without too much breakup. Yes, it has. Great. Wonderful. Well, um, it's been a great pleasure, Jonathan, having a chat today. And I, I hope your, your viewers and listeners have you know, taken something from this that has helped to join some dots in their mind about their own journey of exploration, whether it you know, be cymatics or some of the related subjects like dolphins or whatever uh, i hope that it has been of some value to some of your uh, some of your listeners and viewers